Many of the drugs that can help us can also hurt us if they are abused. Currently, the opioid crisis is a problem for many people. The monkey on your back, addiction and recovery. Tonight, on Call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. I'm Dr. Deborah Johnston. An addiction is a brain disorder. Drugs can change how the brain works and those changes can cause problems with a person's behavior. But first, a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. It's a multiple choice question tonight. According to the CDC, what percentage of 2019 overdose deaths in the United States involved an opioid? A, 30, B, 50%, C, 70%, or D, 90%. Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a copy of the book, The Picture of Health. Each of Dr. Holmes' essays, originally written for On Call with the Prairie Doc, comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We will announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in. We answer your questions about addiction as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on your screen. Joining us tonight in the studio is Dr. Vivek Anand, a psychiatrist with Avera Medical Group University Psychiatry Associates in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and remotely via Zoom is Malia Holbeck, a chemical dependency counselor and manager at Avera Addiction Care Center in Sioux Falls. Welcome. Thank you both so much for joining us tonight. I think this is going to be just a great program and we're going to have so much wonderful information to share with our, our audience and they can learn a lot from us. So I'd like to start just by having you each give us a little bit of information about yourselves and your background and how you came to work in addiction. Um, Malia, can I start with you? Yeah, you bet. So I... Um, have been in South Dakota so my my entire life so I don't know if that is a interesting fact or if that makes me sound incredibly boring but um, I um, initially went out to, to school for um, for my um, social work degree and started um, getting into the field um, had started working in the, in the addictions field and really started to enjoy that so I ended up deciding to go back to school um, and got my classes that I needed to to be able to get to get certified in addictions counseling and at that point decided that I needed to con further myself um, and ended up getting my master's of social work through, through Florida State um, virtually at that time so um, I've been working in um, an adolescent treatment um, facility for for seven years and then took a period of time where I did some um, some social work um, in a healthcare system um, prior to taking the position with Avera where I've been for, for approximately seven years. So with Avera addiction services that we have in, in Sioux Falls here, we have a full continuum of care, which includes um, an inpatient residential program for adults, um, all the way down to outpatient services. And we are currently in process with being able to build an adolescent unit for, for addiction services as well. That's fantastic, there's a huge need that's going to be really, really valuable for our population. Vivek, how about you? What is your background and how did you come to work with addiction? Yeah, so I've been working with addiction for a long time now. So after I, I it, it, mostly since you know, 2012, uh, I initially got interested in you know, tobacco work. So I was in North Carolina at the time. I'm fairly new to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I've been here for slightly over I would say almost one and a half years, kind of. Uh, and uh, so my initial interest in addiction started with tobacco work. So I have done a lot of research uh, based off of tobacco and uh, slowly over time I got interested in, uh, you know, other substance use disorders. Uh, and, uh, and then since I've been here, I've been managing an addiction center uh, in Sioux Falls with Avera and that has uh, 
uh, put me in touch with a lot of patients with substance use disorders. What would you say the most common substance use um, disorder that you see here? What substance is it that seems to really appeal to South Dakotans? Yeah, so nationwide, you know, alcohol use disorders are the most prevalent uh, substance use disorders, and South Dakota tends to mimic that. Uh, in my experience, uh, maybe a little more than uh, you know, just replicating the national sample. So uh, at the addiction center with Avera, we see almost 96, 97% of patients who get admitted have alcohol use disorder as their primary use disorder. Oftentimes, you know, it accompanies other uh, substance use disorders, uh, mostly methamphetamine or uh, sometimes opioid use disorders. Okay. Malia, how much opioid use disorder do you find yourself treating? I know we have heard so much about the opioid epidemic and we worry so much about that as primary care physicians prescribing medications. Um, how many of your, your patients would you say have an opioid use disorder or that's part of their clinical picture? So what we're seeing in our facility is, um, and actually a, a smaller percentage of individuals that are coming in for, for an opioid use disorder, um, which is, I, I think, kind of interesting. Um, you know, I'm not, um, they might be seeking out um, other, other pathways, too, to be able to get help, too. I think one thing that I've seen with the opioid epidemic is, there's been a lot of education and information out there um, to be able to give patients access to medication assisted treatment too. So fortunately, um, you know, we have Dr. Anand here too, who has been able to prescribe that to our patients within our addiction facility, but also with, with Sioux Falls, um, or I mean, within, within Avera as well. Um, so it's nice that we have this community resource within Sioux Falls that we, we are able to help individuals that um, are needing um, a medication-assisted treatment uh, because of their opioid use disorder and being able to provide them um, you know, the, the treatment program um, to go along with that too. So we are finding with, with that medication that really can be a nice um, a complement uh, to also use um, using clinical um, and treatment services as part of that, that program of recovery for that individual. Let's talk a little bit about medication-assisted um, addiction treatment. Uh, Vivek, I know that there are different medications used for different uh, uh, substance use disorders. Can you tell our audience just a little bit about um, which addictions might have medication that could help them and uh, what those medications are? Yeah, so there are several medications that can be used for a variety of substance use disorders. And uh, so the most popular medications, you know, lately have been, you know, Suboxone, which is buprenorphine, which is commonly prescribed for opioid use disorders. It's an FDA-approved medication for more than a decade, and uh, it is uh, related with really good outcomes. Besides uh, buprenorphine or Suboxone, uh, we have methadone that is also used for opioid use disorder. We have naltrexone, uh, which is used for opioids and alcohol. There are several more medications that are used for alcohol use disorders, and uh, uh, some are used, you know, uh, they're approved for it, and some are off-label, uh, but there's a variety of uh, medications available to help with, you know, both the detoxification, uh, post-acute withdrawal, uh, and, you know, recovery process in general later. I think it's important to clarify for our audience that um, when we say a medication is used off-label, that means that the manufacturer has not gone through the process of presenting evidence to the FDA and getting the okay to say that this is a safe and effective medicine for this use. And a lot of the medications that we may use off-label are uh, available generically. There's no longer a drug company who really has a vested interest in getting an approval for this process. Um, so in medicine, we use a lot of medications off-label for different things. So um, gabapentin comes to mind Absolutely. as a medicine that might yeah. get used for a variety of different purposes um, without that FDA approval. Right. So. Right. And you, you're right. And so to have FDA approval, you need to have at least two double-blind randomized controlled trials, and those trials are really expensive. Yes. Uh, and you know when medications are avail available generically, 
uh, then there is no vested interest in that. So these off-label medications may have equal efficacy, but you know, to get them approved through FDA uh, needs much more effort, uh, which is not put in sometimes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So one question that we had come in, um, <coughs> with opioids being so addicting, why are they prescribed after what people might think of as minor surgery, such as dental surgery? Um, Malia, do you wanna, you wanna bunt with that one? Yeah, I, um, I'll start and then I'll, I'll let Dr. Anad follow up with me too. But, um, you know, I think oftentimes, you know, we, we have surgeries and I think it is appropriate that, you know, we, we do need medications to, to be able to treat um, that pain um, to be able to, to get through that recovery process too. Um, but, you know, for some people, um, kind of what I've been seeing in my clinics, you know, they oftentimes kind of have a different different experience with that medication too. Um, and for some people, kind of what they have reported to me in the clinic is, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, they get that medication after surgery and they, they take it as prescribed. So maybe they have a large amount of uh, medication that, uh, that gets given to them. And they weren't aware that they were able to stop that medication when, when the pain ended and they continued to take that medication um, you know, even if they had a 90-day um, prescription for that. And they kind of had found, you know, even through that 90 days that they started to kind of get dependent on that medication um, where they were feeling like they're needing to continue to, to take that. So they started to see how they were able to, to start developing that, that dependence um, where, where they could, um, you know, for some people, you know, they were able to recognize that and be able to, to ask for help or to stop that medication. Um, and then some other individuals that, that I've worked with too is that's kind of where that addiction piece really started taking off for them. Yeah, I mean, the important uh, distinction here is, you know, acute pain and chronic pain. Mm -hmm. So acute pain needs to be treated differently. And uh, that is where the opioids have a role. Uh, now, uh, you know, prescribing carefully with caution, you know, prescribing less number of pills, uh, maybe trying different alternative agents like NSAIDs because people's tolerance for pain is different. Uh, so that may be some uh, approaches to take, uh, but acute pain uh, most times will uh, respond favorably for, to the opioids. However, when it comes to the chronic pain, then opioids might not be the best uh, best medications out there because they can sometimes increase pain over time mm -hmm. and uh, so that needs to be dealt with differently and my understanding is when, uh, when dentists provide medications uh, they're providing medications for a short period of time with short number of uh, tablets uh, without any refills uh, and it's mostly directed at acute, acute pain. And I've certainly seen a change in the 20-some years that I've been practicing with the number of pills and the frequency of refills that I've seen from my surgical colleagues, be they dental um, procedures or general surgery or orthopedic surgery. Uh, by and large, we're giving a lot fewer pills for a lot shorter period of time. I also think that there's a difference in expectation there. We went through a period in time where uh, people expected to have no pain after surgery right. and um, now I think people are we're able to tell them you know that's really not realistic you know how much how much pain is reasonable and how much pain is unreasonable um, we don't want to have people suffer but that doesn't mean that you should have no pain at all after something right so I think that's a good thing um, <clears throat> Another question that came in, what are the effects of opioids and alcohol combined? That sounds like a good question for you. Opioids and alcohol combined can be a very dangerous combination. As opioids have sedative or sleep-inducing effects, and alcohol certainly mimics that. Now, alcohol can be looked at as a substance that acts on multiple receptors. So it acts on, uh, you know, something called GABA receptors, it acts on you know, opioid receptors. So their combination can be very dangerous uh, to the point that it can, uh, uh, it is related to a high mortality and morbidity. So uh, tell us how an opioid might cause death. 
So opioids, so when you take opioids, uh, it acts on, uh, it reach opioids, you know, rise in the, uh, in the blood, the, you know, then it goes to the brain and uh, they act on, you know, multiple uh, areas in the brain. And one of those is a respiratory center. Uh, which is depressed when you take in large quantities of opioids. And so uh, when somebody overdoses on an opioid um, type medication, uh, their respiratory rate decreases and uh, the breathing becomes shallow. And that is how they have a bad respiratory outcomes, including death. Yeah. So basically with an opioid overdose, people would f almost fall asleep. They would mm -hmm. seem to fall asleep and then their breathing would get more and more shallow and eventually it could just stop entirely. So um, that's obviously a very concerning situation. Um, and alcohol can also suppress mm -hmm. respiration. So if you put the two of them together, I may be able to take my handful of, of Vicodin under a normal circumstance, but if I wash it down with a beer or two, I may get into deep trouble. So it's, it's very important knowing that mixing substances can, can cause big problems. So, um, Leah, here's a great question for you. Uh, is opioid treatment covered by insurance? I know you're involved with a lot of the administrative aspects of this wonderful treatment program. So what can you tell us about insurance coverage for addiction treatment? Yeah, so you know, fortunately there's some parity laws that had got passed historically, which was a really good thing. Um, and, and basically what that means is individuals that do have um, an insurance carrier the insurance company is actually required to cover any behavioral health services. So, so that's going to cover mental health, and it's also going to cover substance abuse treatment. So that was um, that was a pretty pretty powerful thing that that had happened, um, but extremely beneficial for those individuals that do struggle with any behavioral health concerns. So. Um, if they are struggling with either mental health or substance use, their insurance is is required to be able to cover uh, that treatment that's going to be appropriate for that individual. And that is really an important step towards getting a handle on on this Epi problem on this epidemic. So. It appeared that this Watertown, South Dakota doctor had it all: a thriving optometry practice and a loving family but she had an addiction that she hid from everyone until an arrest exposed her secret. In about 2007 is when I had my first surgery. I had a, an emergency appendectomy, and then I had two more surgeries after that. So I had three surgeries within about a three year time frame, and of course I was prescribed opioid pain medication with that. And by the third surgery is when I started using more pain pills than what was prescribed. You know, and it started out very innocently. I, you know, I had taken pharmacology classes in optometry school, so I knew what opioids did to the brain and the body. Uh, but I also knew my body really well, and I knew that I would know when I was taking too much. And so I just started by taking, you know, instead of taking two every four to six hours, as far as, you know, Vicodin or Percocet, I took two and a half, and then I took three, and then three and a half, and four. And it just continued to escalate to the point where what started out as pain management very quickly led into this is the stuff that I need to get me through the day. I just felt overall like a better human being. Looking back on that, I know that that was not the case, but that's what drugs do to your brain. I was arrested, uh, there was, I had a huge amount of relief. I remember sitting in the back of the cop car with my hands cuffed behind my back and thinking, this is finally over. Because every day I would wake up and the first thing I would think about is, how many pills do I have? And do I have enough to get me through the day? And if I don't, how am I gonna get those? Treatment for me was, um, it was amazing. It was exactly what I needed. One, because I think all of us that are in addiction, whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs, whether it's gambling, whatever addiction it may be, our brain tells us 
we're fine. It's everybody else out in the world that's not fine. And so to learn through treatment that, you know, it's a, it's a problem with my thought process and how to deal with that was, I mean, it was immeasurable for my healing process. I love eye care. I love taking care of people's eyes. And I loved it even in my active addiction. But to now be able to do it and be clean and sober and still have the support of my staff, my family, um, the community, my patient base, and know that I can continue to not only grow my practice, but also sometimes when I have people sitting in my exam chair here, I can also help them if they're struggling with something that they feel like they can't overcome. Dr. Weiss's story is a reminder that addiction can happen to anyone at any age. No socioeconomic, no, no social strata is immune to addiction, so we all need to be aware of it. The other thing that I was really struck with, and I'm, I would like to hear what you two have to say, she made the observation about having the support of her staff and her patients, and um, I, oh, that strikes me as something that's so important for addiction recovery. So what are your observations, Malia, about the importance of um, community support for people that are going through addiction and recovery? That's one really big piece of, of the treatment program that we provide. Um, you know, we operate on the philosophy that you know, we want to be able to take individuals through clinical management and help them transition into self-management of care. So a big part of that self-management of care is really getting them to build up their support system um, to be able to self, uh, help them in, in recovery. So their support systems can look like a variety of different things from friends to family members. Um, to also support systems within within the community too. Um, and also support systems um, can help in such a variety variety of ways. And um, you know, and for for all of us, um, you know, we we have some support systems that we use, you know, for for everything. Um, you know, throughout life. So, you know, we got to kind of remember too, you know, when people are in recovery and especially early recovery too, this is some really challenging, it's going to be a really challenging time for them, especially for that, for that first year. Um, so if they can lean into their support systems um, to be able to utilize them, to be able to help them, uh, to keep them on track um, and, and have them make this, this first year, which typically is going to be the first year in early recovery, um, easier um, than it would be trying to do it independently. You know, one thing that's kind of been interesting over this past year, too, um, that we've kind of really had to rethink, um, you know, how do we utilize support systems is the impact of the pandemic that uh, people have had on their recovery. So, you know, just as I'm saying here is, you know, we're really pushing people to get out there. Don't isolate, make sure that you are finding new people, new friends, um, new support systems. You know, the pandemic really kind of put a little wrench in, in that for us. And, um, you know, where, you know, people weren't able to go back to their jobs because they were sent home to work. Um, so they're kind of required to isolate, um, not wanting to go out in public because, um, because of the fear of, of getting sick. And that was kind of following recommendations as well. Um, you know, they weren't able to go to meetings and, you know, you name it, that all kind of switched. So um, that also kind of made it especially challenging um, for in individuals in recovery because that um, the, the ability to be able to connect to the support systems were were harder to do so or looked different than we would normally um, able to connect with with people. Yeah, uh, Dr. Anand, yeah. what <clears throat> other challenges have you seen with addiction uh, during the pandemic that are maybe related to the pandemic? So speaking to what Malia said, you know, pandemic really restricted the social 
uh, outlets that people had. So, you know, social networking, you know, be it with family, uh, be it with uh, friends or peers and, uh, and co-workers, that is really important. So that got restricted to a big, uh, to, you know, a sizable amount. So, you know, and uh, other than that, you know, COVID, the pandemic itself has been such a stressful experience for people. Uh, and a lot of them have, uh, uh, you know, taken respite uh, by using substances. Uh, so a lot of them, you know, resorted to using alcohol or cocaine or methamphetamine because uh, the peer groups, you know, uh, they were not there to reinforce abstinence. Uh, you, you couldn't, um, you know, guide others or advise others. And that just led to uh, a spike in using substances. And that was also evident, you know, the amount of overdoses and the deaths related to substances during the COVID pandemic. It's definitely been a big stress on people in general and on the healthcare system. And, and maybe the ICUs have seen more of it, but certainly the psychiatry field and the addiction field has seen a lot of it too. So um, one other thing, a caller called in with a question about um, the responsibility that the healthcare industry should take for the opioid crisis. Um, and the caller pointed out that uh, addiction often starts with prescriptions, and that is something that Dr. Weiss's experience speaks to as well. Vivek, what are, what are your thoughts on that topic? Now, so uh, a while ago, pain was uh, really, uh, considered as something that should be really treated down to uh, the complete resolution. And uh, at that time, you know, pharmaceutical companies came up with all these different opioid preparations and they got them cleared through FDA. And at the time, the consensus was that go after pain and, uh, and make sure that there is no pain. And that led to uh, primary care providers and other specialists to prescribe these pain medications. At the time, uh, the, the, the studies that had gotten these medications approved uh, had resulted in no abuse potential for these medications. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so primary care providers and physicians, other, other specialties, they were not even aware that you know, this uh, pain medication is going to cause such a big pandemic or epidemic over time. Uh, and so that led to aggressive uh, prescription uh, for pain related disorders and uh, but you can only prescribe pain medications for so long and it became evident over the years that uh, the medications were actually addicting with such a high addiction potential and that was a new problem at hand uh, that nobody knew how to deal with uh, and uh, and then when primary care you know doctors you know start prescribing medications people just transitioned on to uh, illegal drugs, uh, including heroin and uh, fentanyl and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so, you know, healthcare industry and uh, there, there is some responsibility there, uh, but um, I think um, the whole, that era was different. Uh, the yeah. pain was uh, aggressively chased at the time without any uh, realization that it's going to turn into something huge. I, when I started practicing, we were taught that pain was a vital sign, mm -hmm. and we were bad doctors if our patients had any pain, and uh, we were we were ranked and graded based on how well our patients' pain control was was handled, and we were told, yeah, well, yeah, those short-acting medicines they're addictive, but these long-acting ones are not addictive, so um, you need to be more aggressive. And I obviously that's been a learning curve for everybody involved. So it's it's very true, as our caller pointed out, that um, healthcare industry and government and pharmaceutical industries industries we have a share of the blame for this. Yeah, so. and I think some of this was also addressed by the previous presidency uh, when I think there was a billion dollars uh, amount in research and other funding for the opioid use disorders, and that has certainly, you know, trickled onto the next presidency and so on and so forth. Yeah. It's yeah. definitely going to be a very important part of, of treatment to get the adequate funding. So, um, <clears throat> let's see 
Here's a good one. Actually, there's lots of good questions that people have been calling in with. So let's talk about cigarettes, because we've talked a little bit about opioids, and we've talked about um, alcohol. Uh, Malia, maybe this is, is not the, the bulk of what you do in your, your practice, but I bet you have a lot of people who have um, nicotine addictions, and what differences do you see between cigarette addiction and vaping addiction? So this has been, you know, that was kind of an interesting topic uh, before we had opened our inpatient addiction facility because uh, we wanted to make sure that we were making the right decisions for our patients. So we did some research on tobacco use disorder um, and found a lot of um, interesting um, information and um, in how tobacco use um, kind of plays a role into people's recovery and the success of the recovery too. Um, so some of the information that we had found is, you know, that it kind of makes sense, you know, once we're kind of reading it is, you know, a lot of people use tobacco um, kind of hand in hand with, with their substances, you know, so typically if people are drinking, you know, and if they're tobacco users, you know, they, um, they, they're doing those, that activity, you know, kind of at, at, the, at the same time. So um, it's really one is kind of a, a, ends, uh, ends up being a trigger, trigger for, for the other one. Um, and another really fascinating um, fact that we had found through some of our research too that is when individuals stop um, their tobacco use at the same time of stopping the other substance use, their long-term outcomes re for recovery um, have, have increased. So we have made the decision as far as when we're treating um, individuals at our addiction facility, our, our inpatient facility that they're not allowed to use any tobacco use here um, with, with our intention is that we're hopefully setting them up for, for better success uh, when, when they get out too. So, but you bring, also bring up, the, bring up vaping too, um, which we, we are starting to see that trend. Um, and we're also seeing that trend, I think, with, with younger, uh, younger adults um, they tend to be the ones that um, that are using or that vape um, versus using uh, maybe some more that more traditional tobacco products. Um, but yeah, that is that's definitely something that um, you know our patients say that is been extremely hard um, to be able to give up that substance. Right. Right. So, I mean, tobacco use disorder certainly, I mean, is, uh, is I would say, under-recognized uh, mm -hmm. uh, disorder, and people tend to kind of uh, uh, not ignore that, but it tends to take a back seat when it comes, uh, you know, when you are faced with alcohol and opioid uh, epidemic, but tobacco use disorder is really important. So I've done uh, plenty of research on tobacco, you know, coming from North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And so actually nicotine use earlier uh, primes your brain into using other substances. So there's research available that, you know, if your brain was exposed to nicotine, you're more likely to use cocaine and other addictive substances later. And that, that also speaks to, you know, long-term outcomes that if you take out the tobacco, uh, then, you know, the longer term outcomes are going to be much more uh, better when it comes to other substances of use. And that is one thing, uh, like Malia said, you know, at Avera Addiction Treatment Center, you know, we, the, we are treating tobacco along with other substances as well. And I, I also think it's important to point out it's not just tobacco, it's nicotine. Absolutely. So it's the <coughs> vaping is also addictive and you get your, your nicotine that way. So uh, it is nicotine use disorder, not tobacco use disorder. I so, would agree in this yeah. era of electronic cigarettes. Uh, it should be renamed as nicotine use disorder. Disorder, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. and, and, and you know, it has certainly uh, disproportionately affected the, the youth. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, you know, there's a huge, huge rise in uh, students, you know, middle school students and high school students using electronic cigarettes uh, and thereby giving themselves much, much larger amounts of nicotine, uh, unlike a, a conventional tobacco cigarette and subsequently priming their brain for additional addictions Absolutely. later on. Another caller had, had called in wanting to know if cannabis 
is addictive. This is certainly a very relevant topic with South Dakota's recent uh, vote to legalize the substance. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Anand, what, what is your professional opinion about whether or not marijuana is addictive? Yeah, so professional opinion based off of research, uh, cannabis is addictive. Uh, cannabis use disorder is a recognized uh, substance use disorder and it has all the behaviors and signs and symptoms that are typically associated with any substance use disorder. And uh, that, can, that can be from you know, tolerance to cannabis withdrawal, cannabis affecting their occupational life, their recreational, social, and a personal life, causing you know, psychological and physical consequences, missing out on obligations at home, at work, uh, and other places. So cannabis certainly has all uh, the traits of, uh, of a substance use disorder, uh, and, and that's what it is. Malia, do you uh, have a lot of patients that are cannabis use disorder patients that you try to counsel and help with sobriety? We do see um, individuals come in with, with cannabis use disorder, and then we also see quite a few patients that will have cannabis use disorder as a, as a secondary substance, too. Um, and I um, am, am kind of curious as to kind of what, what the trends will change with as, as future laws are changing here in South Dakota, too. But um, one thing that I'll kind of also note to, from what Dr. Anat said, too, is, you know, there are risk factors, too, um, that contribute to people um, you know, developing um, into an addiction, too. So. The younger an individual starts using a substance, whether it's uh, cannabis or alcohol or other, um, puts them at higher risk for developing an addiction. Um, and again, the the frequency of use also is putting them at higher risk for developing an addiction um, as well. And I, I think that's a really important topic and we have a role in that I'd, I'd like to get to now. And, but I think we're going to have more conversations about what kinds of things predispose an individual to develop an addiction or a substance use disorder. Spirituality can be a powerful component in addiction recovery, even in those who don't have an articulated faith or religion. You know, when we look at psychology and counseling today, like a lot of the practices that are recommended in um, psychotherapy, like really draw on spiritual disciplines. The field of psychology recognizes the spiritual self and the spiritual being. You know, things like prayer and daily meditation and taking that time, um, you know, in stillness and solitude and building in those spaces throughout the day, self-care. I mean, it, it really all kind of comes back to caring for the spiritual part of a person. And, and even in terms of like, we can drill all the way down to like, physical exercise and diet and all of those other disciplines, it really is about like caring for yourself, you know, having that sense of value for yourself as a person, as a spiritual being, um, and kind of caring for your body in those ways. This is another one that I think um, a lot of counseling tracks might agree with is just the like practice of working through forgiveness and um, you know, moral inventory is something that we talk about a lot in 12-step programs where you know, you're really working on getting out of denial and facing the things that have happened in life and um, taking that inventory to see like where is my responsibility where is my part where do i have the influence to change what's happening in these circumstances you know it it can be you can look at it as a very practical exercise you can look at it as a very spiritual exercise and when we get into those things like gratitude and forgiveness and meditation and self-examination that those those terms, those disciplines have become very secularized, but they're drawn from spiritual traditions and they have their roots in spiritual practice. And so it's kind of interesting really to look at a lot of these things and to see, you know, even if someone doesn't necessarily have an articulated faith or religion, 
there's still a lot of benefit that people can experience from engaging in practices that have been drawn from spiritual tradition. I think that one thing that's really significant about looking at recovery in terms of a spiritual healing process, that really, you know, we talk about turning our will and our lives over to the care of God. And it's a matter of letting go of the things that we can't control, but also picking up the things that we do have the influence to change in our own lives. You know, we take responsibility where it's ours to take, and we let go of the things that we can't do anything about. And you know, just that, that sense of courage to change the things we can, that's a life-changing principle. This has been this has been a great conversation, and we're we've talked enough that we're running short on time, and we've got a lot of really good questions. So we'll try to to get through them um, efficiently. Uh -huh. One of the questions that I think plays in very well with the roll in we just had here, the little video clip uh, about what support groups are there, there might there be for people who are agnostic or atheistic are there support groups that are maybe more comfortable fit for people without a religious uh, inclination absolutely so uh, there are a lot of uh, groups uh, for that so there can be you know group psychotherapy which is based on, on, on evidence-based models like cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, contingency management, and that sort of does not have a spirituality aspect. Uh, smart recovery groups are available uh, that uh, work on the same concept of uh, changing you know, cognitive distortions and associated behaviors uh, that go along with those cognitive distortions to achieve abstinence. So uh, the bottom line, ask your addiction professional to point you in the right direction. Absolutely. They'll have some resources for you. Um, another topic, we were talking just before the video clip about what things might predispose an individual to developing an addiction. Is it uh, a personality trait or what other things do you see? So around 40 to 60 percent of addiction is genetic. Uh, so there's, it is uh, no different from hypertension or diabetes, and so there are a lot of aspects is that. Now, uh, later, the, you know, it depends on the timing of first substance use. So if somebody used a substance earlier than 18 years of age, they're more likely to develop a substance use disorder. So for example, if you were to use before 18, one out of four people are going to have a diagnosed substance use disorder compared to if you were to use it after age 21, then one out of 25 are going to have a substance use disorder. And that's a huge difference. So, you know, the timing of use, uh, the genetic predisposition, uh, the, the environment. Uh, so, you know, a lot of that is learned behavior, or at least that's how it starts. And then over time translates into a substance use disorder. So environment is also really important. Uh, and, uh, and associated stress. So sometimes when people are stressed, uh, they find respite in uh, substances. Uh, which work on the reward area and you know have that dopamine release which uh, uh, which helps them feel less stressful so you know those are some of the things uh, so better mental health care uh, better networks you know family peers uh, you know uh, and uh, and more you know better family structure to make sure that there is no usage and better family support support Absolutely. for our families I mm -hmm. think is important I think the the bottom line there is it's multifactorial, but what it is not is a character failing. Yeah. Um, let's talk about alcohol abuse and substance abuse in high school and college students. What should parents look for? Well, parents should look for any changes in their behavior. So, uh, you know, any substance use disorder causes a lot of changes in, you know, how, uh, how students or how college kids behave. And uh, so any changes in behavior, you know, smelling alcohol on them or uh, declining academic performance, uh, all those should be red flags that needs to be explored along with their, uh, their peers and, uh, and, you know, friend circle that they associate themselves with. Can drug addiction lead to other mental health disorders? 
or vice versa? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, that is a, <laughs> <laughs> that is a hard one to answer, but uh, there's a, there appears to be a bidirectional relationship. So uh, if uh, people have m m people with substance use disorders are more likely to have mental health problems, and people with uh, psychiatric disorders are more likely to have uh, uh, substance use disorders. It goes both ways, exactly. So, um, how about the treatment and recovery from meth abuse? Malia, do you want to, to give us a little bit of your perspective on that? Yeah, so with uh, stimulant use disorder, one thing that, that we're finding is um, that particular um, substance is needing to get treated a little bit differently than maybe some of the other substances. Um, is, so what we're, we're, research is finding is more intensive treatment um, for a longer period of time seems to be um, a better um, option um, to be able to treat that particular type of substance use disorder. Excellent. Um, another quick question that I just want to address quickly here. Um, if someone brings a family member with an addiction problem to the hospital, why can't they just be kept against their will. <laughs> <laughs> well, really quick. Well, to uh, take somebody's rights away and keep them in the hospital against their will, there needs to be, you know, evidence to uh, suggest that that person's use is uh, going to harm them or put their lives at risk or Imminently. others' life. Uh, imminent danger, put them or others at imminent danger. And that might be grounds, grounds for involuntary commitment. Uh, yeah. But if that is not uh, evident, uh, and uh, then it would be difficult to you know commit somebody. Thank you both so much for sharing your expertise um, for tonight's quiz question answer. According to the CDC, what percentage of 2019 overdose deaths in the United States involved an opioid? 30%, 50%, 70%, or 90%? And the answer is. C, 70%. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in 2019, an average of 38 people died every day from overdoses involving prescription opioids. And the winner of tonight's quiz is David Eddy from Rapid City. Thank you, David, for participating. A book will be in the mail to you soon. And we'll be right back. Extra, extra, read the Prairie Doc Perspectives weekly column in your local newspaper. More than 130 newspapers in the region print the newspaper column written by the Prairie Docs, covering a variety of medical and health-related topics. Ask your local paper if they print Prairie Doc Perspectives. Bacchus was a member of the Roman pantheon of gods. In ancient times, he had a variety of attributes, but modern culture primarily remembers him as a god of wine and debauchery. Perhaps the image of his followers, or bacchants, as individuals who had abandoned society to live in a raucous state of perpetual inebriation, has contributed to our perception of alcoholism and addiction. When I talk to my patients about their use of substances, be it alcohol, prescription medications, or street drugs, I find that most believe they don't have a problem. They tell me they aren't using every day, or they still make it to work in the morning, or they haven't been arrested, or my personal favorite, they only drink beer. There are many substances that people can misuse and to which people can become addicted. If one peruses the current handbook that guides diagnosis in psychiatry, it is easy to see the similarities between alcohol use disorder and opioid use disorder and cannabis use disorder and a myriad of other addictions. Sufferers may use more or more often than they intended. They may want to cut back but be unsuccessful when they try. They may spend unusual amounts of time seeking or using or recovering from the use of their preferred substance. They may have strong cravings. They may give up other activities in favor of using. 
Their performance at work or school may suffer, or they may fail to meet family commitments. They may find themselves needing a greater quantity to achieve the same effect or having withdrawal symptoms. They may continue to use despite knowing their use is detrimental to their relationships or that it is damaging and dangerous to their health. It is important to recognize that a person does not need to have all the above mentioned experiences to have a substance use disorder. Indeed, the diagnosis can be made in the absence of these criteria. Most who suffer from addiction are not souls lost on Skid Row. They are our neighbors, our friends, our family. Genetics is an important predictor of who will develop a substance use disorder, but it is not the only factor. Life experiences, particularly trauma experienced in childhood, personality traits, and the social environment all affect risk. Addiction is a common disease. Drugs and alcohol kill hundreds of Americans every day. The same is true for heart disease and cancer, and we don't criticize the patients for these diseases. It's time we show the same compassion for people diagnosed with addiction and consign the image to the Bacants to mythology. A big thank you to our guests, Vivek and Malia, for volunteering their time to help us learn more about addiction and recovery. If you would like more information about this program or to see and hear more episodes of this program, please like and follow us on Facebook or YouTube or visit us at prairiedoc.org. And be sure to look for the podcast of this program, Prairie Doc On Call, wherever you get your podcasts. And that does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. with many health concerns, prevention can be important. Exercise, diet, and being careful as we move help immensely. Protecting and repairing your bones and joints. Next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. Hello, I'm Dr. Tom Dean. I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the Healing Words Foundation, and I'd like to take a minute to ask for your help. I grew up on a farm west of Wessington Springs. After high school, I left the area and pursued medical education in New York, Seattle, and I even spent a year in England. When we completed our education, my wife Kathy, a nurse midwife, and I returned to Wessington Springs, where we have lived and practiced for more than 40 years. Just like you, we love our hometown. For many years, I've been a, an advocate for small communities and for good access to health care in rural communities. Prairie Doc programs play a uniquely important role in helping rural populations maintain easy access to up-to-date healthcare knowledge. Rick and Joni Holm started this mission of providing healthcare information free of charge to all of us, especially to those who have limited access to healthcare professionals. Now it's up to us to help our four Prairie Docs and many others continue the legacy. I would urge you, as Kathy and I have done, to contribute to the Healing Words Foundation. Go to prairiedoc.org and make your contribution today. Thank you. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call with the Prairie Doc on South Dakota Public Broadcasting.
Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, First Bank and Trust, South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Vance Thompson Vision, Monument Health, Black Hills Medical Society, Brookings Madison Flander District Medical Society, Peer District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Urology Specialists, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Lake Ponset Sailing Academy, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Dakota Bank, South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swift Tell Communications.